Welcome back to Listen Well. I'm Dr. Mo Aswedan. In today's episode, we'll be talking about a very disabling illness that affects millions of people worldwide, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. We'll also talk about its links to emotional health and issues such as depression. I'm joined by two special guests who know a lot about this disorder, both from a research medical perspective, but also from a lived experience. Dr. Mark Miravides is from Val de Braun University Hospital and Research Institute, where he's a senior pulmonologist, a consultant, and a researcher who's published a lot about this disorder, both from the perspective of the lungs, but also from the perspective of depression. And Mr. Alphonse Vinuela is a patient with a lived experience with COPD and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. He works as an NLP consultant, a writer, and now as a patient advocate. I really hope you're excited to join me for this episode. I think we'll all learn a lot, so I invite you to sit back, relax, and listen well. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Dr. Mark, I'd like to start with you. What is COPD? Um, how, how do people experience it? Yes, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a respiratory disease, a chronic disease, basically caused by smoking, not only, but basically caused by smoking. And the patients suffering from this disease, they usually have shortness of breath, progressive shortness of breath, cough, sputum production, and frequent chest infections, particularly during winters. It affects the quality of life, and we can somewhat control it with medications, but it's usually progressive. Is it uh, very common? Do a lot of people have it worldwide? It is. It is. It's considered to be the fifth cause of death worldwide, and there are approximately three million people suffering from COPD around the world. And in some countries, such as in my country, in Spain, it affects 10% of individuals older than 40 years. So it's really a health care problem. So you mentioned o older than 40 years. Does it tend to be uh, an illness that starts at that age, or can it start younger? It can start younger. But usually um, the patients suffering from COPD start having uh, symptoms around the fourth decade of life. And they used to go to the doctors when they are around in the early 50s mm -hmm. and when the disease has already progressed. Okay. So we used to see um, people around 50, 60 years of age when they first consult for the disease. But as you mentioned, the disease used to start earlier. Okay. And is it disabling in addition to being a leading cause of death? It is, it is, seriously. I mean, the patients initially may still continue with their daily lives, but when the disease progresses, they progressively have difficulties in having the usual activities, uh, the daily activities, their work, even their social relations, mm. and they tend to be more at home, uh, not able to go out to do exercise and to have even uh, social relationships. And if we don't stop it, we don't stop the progression, eventually uh, this can be also the cause of death for some of these patients. Mm -hmm. uh, Alphonse, let me turn to you. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your experience with COPD? When did it start? How were you diagnosed? And what was the journey like for you? Yes, I was uh, diagnosed with COPD in 2000. I was 44 years old. Uh, and later, I was diagnosed with uh, having ATT, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficit, and with this deficit, and because I smoke, so uh, my COPD gets worse quickly. Uh, before being diagnosed, and uh, uh, for 50 more years, I was an active uh, professional as a trainer and, and, and consultant, but year by year, I found myself more limited. Mm. Uh, then I had to leave my professional activity because it was very difficult for me to travel, uh, to get the plane, to get the train, and give my classes or conference uh, uh, presentially. So I have to quit uh, and I have to abandon my profession. Mm. When, you know, it sounds like it affected you a lot. What do you, what's it like on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the symptoms you have or just doing your daily activities. What is that like for you? Well, I have the symptoms uh, Dr. Mirabidi said before. 
I have a cough, I have a, a respiratory problems, uh, I was very tired, and uh, I have infections, uh, but uh, well, it, it affects my, 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 my life very deeply because I have to keep uh, all, the, all the things I, I, I used to do, uh, exercise, uh, uh, I, was a sky, I was a skier, uh, I like to, to, to ride bike, I like to run, I like to walk on the mountain because I work in a ski resort in the Pyrenees. But I have to keep all these, all these things mm. because my difficult to, to breathe properly. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mark, uh, Alphonse mentioned alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, what is that? Yeah, this is a genetic disease. In fact, um, this disease produces the lack of a protein, so the liver is not able to produce this protein, and this protein protects the lungs from different insults, for example, tobacco smoking, pollution, infections. So a um, normal individual without the deficiency is somewhat protected, not completely, but somewhat protected. But a, an individual with a deficiency is unprotected completely. Mm. And therefore, if particularly if he or she smokes, then the lung can be progressively destroyed and suffers a COPD that usually can be even a bit more severe for, than for smokers without the deficiency. And how would someone know whether they have the deficiency or not? Well, it has to be suspected. It has to be suspected by the healthcare providers. And there is a very simple test, uh, a simple blood test, uh, a measuring the alpha-1 and the trypsin in the blood that can give you a diagnosis. But again, it has to be suspected. And since the, the clinical manifestations of the disease are the similar or almost the same mm -hmm. as in a COPD without the deficiency, some of these cases are still undiagnosed. I'd like to talk to both of you about the emotional aspects of COPD. I mean, I can imagine that for someone living with a condition like this that's uh, changing their life, uh, feels disabling, and also affecting them from morning to evening is going to have some effect on their emotions. Let me start with you, Dr. Mark. Uh, what sort of things have you seen with your patients in terms of specific mental health conditions? And is there research around that with this patient group? Yes, there is. I mean, since this is a chronic disease of adults, uh, it is um, also surrounded by a series of comorbidities. And among these comorbidities, depression and anxiety are amongst the most frequent, in fact. Unfortunately, they are um, very unrecognized in, in many cases because these uh, patients are attended by pulmonologists. Uh, some of them, or the, most of them, are not really trained in this type of uh, diseases or disorders, or mental disorders. And sometimes these patients do not receive adequate treatment for these conditions. But we have conducted some studies, some epidemiological studies, uh, suggesting that more than 50% of our patients with COPD have some kind of depression. And this is very important because it also limits their quality of life. Yeah, because COPD is one of uh, the most disabling illnesses, but also in my field in psychiatry, mental health, we know that depression is a very disabling illness. So I would imagine if someone has both, they feel even more disabled. And I would imagine it affects their treatment. Do you see that with your patients in the yes. clinic? Yes, we see uh, some patients that do not adhere to treatment, the patients that have negative uh, thoughts about their health. They don't do exercise, they stay at home, they don't want to socialize, they don't want to go out. And this only goes against their, uh, the evolution of their disease. Because we know that in COPD in particular, as an example, uh, physical exercise is very important. Mm -hmm. And going out and walking and having relationships, that's very important for their, their health. And also to adhere to treatment, have a positive uh, attitude for the treatment, and also be strong enough to quit smoking, those who are still smoking, and for all of this, they need this mental state that allows them, gives them the tools to really confront this situation. Mm. And frequently, this is not the case. Yeah. Uh, Alphonse, uh, can you tell us about your experience, your emotional journey with this illness? You mentioned earlier about your lifestyle and your job um, changing. But in terms of your emotions, how has that been in your journey of treatment? Well, at the beginning, it was difficult 
uh, to accept the seriousness of uh, COPD. Uh, I felt not, not so bad, but when I start having physical uh, problems in, or performance problems, I start to worry. Uh, the more I learn about the disease, the more distressed I become, especially with the mortality statistics, uh, all the figures and the average uh, lifespan of the patients. Uh, I was making numbers about how many years I thought I had left, and it was all negative. That's the thing we, we, we have not to do, because if you get into the internet and you see all the figures and you are not a doctor, you cannot interpret it properly, all these figures and all these dates. But fortunately, over the years, my habits and thoughts uh, have changed. Now I make a routine, as Dr. Meraviges said before, I do exercise uh, with small weights, with a stationary bike, and uh, I walk in the afternoon. Uh, well, in Barcelona, sometimes it's very difficult because the conditions of the weather and pollution, it affects uh, a lot to the people with uh, pulmonary diseases. And uh, I can still do some traveling and do all this routine with needing supplemental oxygen. Mm. Uh, at the moment, I don't need oxygen as a supplement. Uh, but uh, the change is uh, mentally. I I am not complaining anymore. I feel very fortunate to be able to access a, and a good doctor, uh, to, to access a good tra treatment and the medicines I need. So you mentioned some things that affected your emotions negatively, going into this downward spiral of negative statistics, yes. and some things that helped you, like your activities. What I'm impressed about is also you've been helping a lot of people uh, as an advocate. So can you tell us about that, uh, advocating for patients? I, yes, I belong to a three uh, pulmonary associations, COPD Spain Association, and another two uh, um, foundations and associations who take care about the, 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 the patients. And I collaborate, uh, and this collaboration helped me a lot emotionally. Mm. Because be, being useful to other people uh, as an active patient, as I am, uh, it motivates me. Uh, the patients of the associations in which I collaborate are mostly very worried uh, and have a very negative uh, view of, of their illness. So I can help them, telling them, uh, well, it's, it's, if you do exercise, if you, as we do, uh, if you have a, a social uh, environment, a positive social environment, and you have a, a, a positive thinking, it will be better for you. And that's why we help in these associations to a new uh, people who, who get the association. You know, I've uh, done many episodes of this podcast and have been honored to talk to many patients and patient advocates. And your answer that you said that it gives you a sense of meaning uh, is a common answer I hear because it really helps someone's emotions to feel useful, but also to take the learnings they have and then to give it to the next person. Absolutely. Yeah. My name is Dr. Katie Colton, and I'm a medical doctor trained in internal medicine. And over 25 years, I'm working in the pharmaceutical industry. A pediatrist, I'm leading global medical affairs in the respiratory therapeutic area. Beatrice has a long history, more than 15 years working diligently to battle respiratory diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, cystic fibrosis, and asthma, with a current focus on COPD and cystic fibrosis. Beatrice currently is extensively involved in supporting medical communities to fight chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, providing improved medications and a medical education. Based on the modern patient centricity principles, we are at Viatris working closely with the patient advocacy groups globally in a ways of continuing medical education, patients advocacy boards, patient councils on the clinical trials design and outcomes. For example, at the recent European Cystic Fibrosis Patient Advisory Board, we had a 10 cystic fibrosis patients representing five European countries, led by the patient advisory board chair. The patients have shared their personal life journeys, discussed the best disease management solutions, 
and recommendations to medical communities for updating the cystic fibrosis treatment guidelines. The plan two hours virtual advisory board has extended to three hours as the patients were excited to help each other and was not enough time to cover all burning topics. And the outcomes of this advisory board were published as a letter to the editor in the prestige journal. We found that the patient centrical advisory board are extremely valuable to better understand the disease state as well as working on the disease management. With Beatrice's extensive list of generics and brand medications in the respiratory therapeutic area, we're able to provide help to people worldwide. Beatrice empowers people to live healthy at every stage of life via access, leadership, and the partnership. Thank you. Dr. Mark, what advice do you have to a patient that has COPD and has depression? What should they be doing? Yes. First, they have to recognize it. Very often, patients with COPD and depression, they are not aware of that. And they think that their state is normal, is how they should feel. And they don't realize that they are suffering from this depression. And they need to actually ask themselves and, and re realize that they need to have a positive attitude. If this positive attitude doesn't exist, they need to ask for help. Mm. Obviously, I mean, most of, the, of my colleagues and, and myself, uh, we have not uh, adequate training in these uh, health problems, in psychiatric problems. So we need to collaborate. We need to have a multidisciplinary approach. And this is not unique for COPD. This is for most chronic diseases. Yes. And that they usually accumulate, unfortunately, as patients and get older. And therefore, we need to have a multidisciplinary team with other specialists, for example, physical trainers. We need mm. also nutritionists. And we also need psychiatrists. Mm. And we need uh, them to help us to address these conditions in our patients. So first, the pulmonologists usually need to recognize that mm. and then to ask for some help with other specialists. Do you think it would help to have screening tools uh, at the initial contact level or maybe during clinics? Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, I mean, there are some questionnaires, some short questionnaires that help us to identify patients who may be suffering from depression mm. and maybe candidates for some specific treatment. And in fact, I can tell you an anecdote. I mean, one of the most widely used questionnaires, quality of life questionnaires in COPD, the CAT score, mm -hmm. the COPD assessment test, is very easy, very short. But we have demonstrated in a study that one third of the variability in the scores is due to depression, not to the lungs. Mm. So we need to recognize that COPD is a disease that is not only the lungs. So we need to see the patient in a more holistic way and understand the problems of the patient and also, to, again, to work in collaboration with other specialists. Right, so it's mind and body. Correct. Um, Mr. Alphonse, let me turn back to you with what we just talked about, uh, have you noticed any difficulties in accessing care um, when it comes to emotional health, depression? Are there barriers in the system? Uh, yes, I think so. The main barrier, as uh, Dr. Mirevid said, is uh, the no acceptance and the self-perception self -perception, sorry, uh, of being a, a sick person in the eyes of the others. And I believe that, that, that patients, the patients uh, I know and from myself, uh, these patients depressed by their COPD need psychological support. And uh, no, the pneumologist uh, <clears throat> uh, um, can be empathic, empathic and help us with uh, advice beyond the medication uh, and other treatments, uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, treatments, of course, and this has been my case with, with Dr. Mirabides. But when there are depressed patients with anxiety and negative mentality, psychological care is absolutely necessary. Uh, that's why uh, we, we, we think uh, we need uh, the pneumologist and the psychiatrist uh, as well. Working together. Working together, yes. Yeah. In, in, in the same focus. Uh, the focus. We are the focus as a patient, of course. So Alphonse, I can imagine as a psychiatrist, but also as just a person, 
The feeling of not being able to breathe can cause anxiety or panic. Does that happen for you or other patients you know? Yes, it happens to me. It's a very bad feeling when you don't have air enough to breathe properly. So you you have uh, sometimes you are walking by the street and you have problems to to breathe and you get in panic and it costs a lot to to breathe in to breathe out. So you have to 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 wait. You have to to keep calm and inspire and do exercises mentally. Uh, you have to be very clean mentally and and to have exercises, breathing, breathing out, because we have to breathe out all, all the all the all the dioxide you have inside. No? So it's, it costs, but but when you are okay after 10, 20 uh, uh, breathings like like this, you can walk again. You can continue your walk. But this, this sometimes is, is very difficult mentally. It's very difficult. Yes. This is this is actually very interesting how you describe it because this is uh, physiologically it it has a, a, an important um, translation because uh, in COPD the really important limitation is to breathe out, so the air is trapped in the lungs, and so patients if they don't realize that if they are not aware of that they start trying to breathe very quickly. And what they, uh, at the end of the day, what they produce is they keep trapping and trapping and trapping air. So what you have to do is to relax, stop, and then to use your personal lips like this and have a, a long exhalation mm -hmm. and try to breathe out all the air you have trapped in your lungs. And this will help you to breathe instead of trying to breathe very quickly, which is absolutely bad for the physiology of this disease. You know, also what's very interesting is the mind-body connection again, because in my field, in psychiatry, we also use this kind of breathing that you described for a panic attack, even in someone who doesn't have COPD, because it slows down your physiology, your heart rate. Uh, and as you said, part of it is in the lungs, but part of it is in the mind, and you just need to calm it down. The other thing I was thinking about, and you mentioned this earlier about air pollution. And so I want to ask both of you, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Mark, uh, how much does the air pollution affect and does it affect people living in different countries or different regions in, in different countries? Yeah, well, it, it's not really clear whether air pollution by itself causes COPD. Basically, the main reason or the main etiological factor for COPD is tobacco smoking. But it is true and we have a lot of evidence that air pollution may cause exacerbations may cause episodes of acute increase in symptoms, where the patients, as Alphonse described it, they feel um, terrible, they feel worse, they feel a, a, a sudden uh, lack of air. Mm. And we see increases in admissions to the emergency departments in days in which there are peaks of air pollution. Mm. And therefore, some of our patients, they, if they can, they even try to move to areas with their clean air air. Okay, uh, Alphonse, has that affected you? The weather or the pollution in the air? Do you do you notice a big difference? Well, I think uh, everything affects uh, us we, as a pulmonary uh, diseases, uh, but uh, uh, we have to avoid all the factors, all the negative factors, and uh, this is one of the worst for me to 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 breathe pollution in our city or in a, in a, some some days. Eh? It's not every day, but uh, always the uh, humidity, uh, the cold. So you have to, uh, with with a uh, weather uh, app, you can mm. see how is the day be, be before you went out uh, home. No? So it's, it's it's better you uh, see the figures uh, of of, uh, of this day uh, to 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 have uh, a clear vision of what it happens to you when you go out. And on days where the air pollution is high, would you avoid going out? Yes, yes. I prefer to stay at home. Yes, I, I do my routine uh, at home with my uh, stationary bike and a little weights. Mm. And I prefer to stay at home, yes. Okay, right. Do you want to leave our listeners with some final thoughts or advice? Yes. Uh, well, I, as under my point of view, and uh, I, when I see the, the, the industry and the, the, the sanitary health system, uh, nomologists, psychologists, and researchers, do they work? But it's also time for patients 
to be more active and facilitate all this work by participating in studies, research, or programs like this podcast. Mm. Uh, for me, it has been a great pleasure to be able to collaborate on this episode of the List and World podcast. And I have to say you thank you, thank you very much to invite uh -huh. me. Thank you, and I think your point about patients' participation, there's actually a field in research in public health called uh, participatory action research, where patients become part of the research, uh, and that's really important. Uh, Dr. Mark, uh, any final thoughts to our listeners? Yes. Uh, for those that are not familiar with COPD, remember that COPD is a, can be a severe disease, but um, it's a disease that can be controlled and that we have very effective treatments that can improve quality of life of our patients. Mm -hmm. You have seen Alphonse, he was diagnosed 23 years ago. It's a particularly severe form of the disease associated with alpha 1 antidepressant deficiency. But despite of that, thanks to the medications, thanks to the training, and in particular, thanks of his attitude, mm. very active attitude, and being uh, in, in engaged and empowered, positive, yeah. positive, and doing exercise, and taking medications, and doing let's say, the right thing. Mm. He is still here with us and without need of oxygen yet. So uh, this is a positive message. But the other important message, again, is that COPD is not only a disease of the lungs. Mm. It is a systemic disease, and among the systemic manifestations, also depression and anxiety are very prevalent. And uh, we have to recognize that, and we need to work in collaboration with other specialists to improve the quality of life and the survival of our patients. Thank you so much to both of you. I've learned so much. I'm sure everyone listening has learned so much. We appreciate your time and we honor your experience. Thank you. I'd like to invite everyone listening to take a conscious breath and hold it for a few seconds. It's amazing to me, and I kept thinking about this throughout the episode, how some of the key physiological tasks of our body, like breathing, are so automatic and we don't think about them. And if we had to think about our breathing all the time, I can say I would probably feel distressed, anxious, and maybe depressed sometimes. I'd like to thank our special guests for teaching us so much from the medical perspective, from the research perspective, and from the lived experience perspective about COPD and its links to depression. I think we need to take this disease very seriously. And like other illnesses we've talked about in this podcast, the key is collaborative care, focusing on the mind and the body, and being kind to ourselves and giving back to the community. And I think if we do this, the world and healthcare would be so much better. Thank you for joining us, and remember, listen well. Mm -hmm.